Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business. Um, let me welcome all of you to our Terry Exec Ed Center and to our Terry Third Thursday series. Uh, got a good lively crowd today, so that's awesome. Um, let me thank you all for being here today. Also, let me thank the alumni board for organizing today's event and this entire series. We've had uh, a great academic year, fiscal year for uh, this series, and we've got a great speaker today, so looking forward to it. I also want to thank uh, our corporate sponsor, Synovus, as well as our media sponsor, WABE, Atlanta Public Broadcasting. So please join me in thanking them. So on campus this past week, uh, we had commencement activities, convocation activities for the Terry College, and so uh, I know some of you were there, so we graduated another outstanding class of Terry College uh, new alumni, and we've had a great year. If you've been in Athens this week, uh, there's no traffic. You can get uh, <laughs> reservations wherever you would like. Uh, it's very different. It's really very stark. And I've uh, yesterday uh, we had an event to recognize some of our staff, and uh, I reminded uh, them that uh, this only lasts for about two weeks, uh, two months, and then in August it's uh, crazy again. But uh, we've had a great year uh, on campus, and uh, looking forward to <laughs> welcoming a new class in just a couple of months. Uh, this is uh, our Exec Ed Center. It's the home of our Executive MBA, our Professional MBA, as well as our new online MBA that will have our first class starting in September. And uh, I know we've got some of our students here uh, from Atlanta, as well as some of our students from Athens, and so we welcome them today. Next month, we'll have Sal Abate. Uh, Sal is the CEO of Verative Corporation, so uh, uh, continuing the great line of speakers. And this morning, what we're going to have is a fireside chat. It's going to be facilitated by Kathleen Phelps. And today's speaker is Mohammed Masakwa. Mohammed is an organizational psychologist and the founder of Vessel. He's a Georgia Bulldog. I think everybody knows that. Uh, so that's not a, a shock. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in 2008. Also a Master's degree in Industrial and Organization Psychology in 2022. Uh, while at UGA, played wide receiver. We all know that. We all watched his terrific career. Uh, in 2008, he was named team captain. He's also selected his first team All-SEC uh, Conference and also an academic All-SEC member. In 2009, he was a second round NFL draft pick for the Cleveland Browns and played professionally for five seasons. Muhammad has turned the lessons he's learned from football into an organizational coaching consultancy. His company, Vessel, works with firms such as Microsoft, State Farm, and Truist to diagnose and overcome the silos and bottlenecks that trip up good teams that impact efficiency. In spring 2017, Muhammad's life changed uh, following a near-death uh, ATV accident where he lost his left hand, and the event sparked the creation of Vessel in a new chapter in his life. He has served on the UGA Alumni Board from 2017 to 2020, and was also honored as a member of the UGA Alumni Association's 2018 40 Under 40 class. So please join me in welcoming Muhammad as well as Kathleen Phelps. All right, we're good to go. Good morning, everyone. It's so fun to be here. It's an honor to be here with Muhammad. I know we got your introduction, but maybe tell us about the important stuff. What are you doing now, family? Um, well, I'm married. Uh, we hit 10 years this year. Uh, my wife is a dog. Uh, my daughter's four. She says, go dogs. She couldn't make it because she was going to school. Uh, I'm originally from Charlotte, so uh, Mike Bobo pulled me out of the state to come to Georgia. I'm very thankful of that. Uh, and live here in Atlanta, uh, see a ton of friends around here, so it feels very safe to be around dogs. Uh, we have one badger in the room, but we're not gonna give them a hard time. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, just, just, Georgia's been great to me. Uh, my family's from Liberia, uh, so uh, always just feel amazed just at what America has been able to offer me and my family 
uh, played football. I think a lot of people know that. Um, and now I'm an organizational psychologist, so excited to be here with you today. Thank you. There's nothing really quite like a four-year-old. It's just, it's just so fun. I will take any and all parenting tips because <laughs> uh, this is a very dynamic age and uh, we're learning on the fly. You know? <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go. I love it. You, you talked about um, being from Liberia. You talked about coming to UGA. One thing that I've heard you talk about a lot is how you live your life with gratitude. And I think that's something a lot of us kind of strive to have, that focus every day. We just talk about where that philosophy comes from and how you, know, you grew that commitment to living with gratitude. Yeah, so uh, my parents came over in the early 80s. There was civil unrest in Liberia. And so right around the time they would have been going to college, they had to flee the country. And so they had me here in America, and things were starting to stabilize uh, in Liberia. So I actually went to Liberia to live around six months, almost until I was four, but had to come back to America because that's when the actual civil war broke out. And so when I got a little bit older, my mom would show me these videos from the war and kids that would have been my age. Uh, you see them, and it's just horrible condition. Buildings are getting blown up. You know, they're missing body parts. And so when you realize, like, that could have been your life, essentially, and how life has turned out now, I just reflect on that and just I'm very appreciative. And another part of that is when you almost die, you know, uh, life could have been over six years ago. You start to realize that you can't take anything for granted because it could change in an instant. And so I'm just very grateful of just how life has turned out and how it continues to evolve and try to enjoy every second of it. Yeah, I love that. It's such, it's such great perspective. You've had such an interesting journey. I think, let's talk about football. Let's just do it since we're, you know, <laughs> we're gonna just start, right? Let's, let's, let's just do it. Go dogs. Get let's, out of the way. Out. <laughs> um, so talk about, talk about your success at Georgia. I think all of us know you had tremendous success, right? Talk about what you learned under Coach Rick, and then, and then talk about, you know, you're drafted in the second round. Like, talk about your experience in the NFL a little bit. Yeah, I'll even start before then. Uh, so where it got really interesting, I went to a high school in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, coached by a guy named Tommy Knotts. And Tommy Knotts, uh, he allowed us to win 109 games in a row, seven straight championships. And so when you have someone like that that just basically breeds excellent, he teaches you not to compromise. He teaches you not to uh, shortchange yourself. He teaches you to kind of shoot for the moon. And you're unapologetic about that. And so having that type of foundation where you almost you aren't living in reality because you think you can actually force your body to do certain things and then you work hard and your body starts to adapt. It gives you a comfort of if I put the work in, results will come. If I put the right work in, not just working for the sake of working. And so that's something that was, was very critical. And then once it gets time to get the scholarship offered, you get tons of schools that are coming and are asking you to come join their program. And it's really the comfort of what Coach Rick built in saying, if I come to this place, this foreign land, uh, hadn't spent much time in Georgia, will it turn out the way that I want it to? On all levels, um, socially, academically, athletically. And you're putting your trust in you know, this person that you don't actually know that well, you're getting to know. And so the values, the man, um, the integrity, everything you think Coach Rick is, uh, he is more uh, in seeing it behind the scenes. And I'd actually say pray for him as well as he continues to be a fighter uh, on his journey right now, but he still continues to lead with grace and we can still reach out to him. And so he's a guy that, he made you believe. Because when you get there, or let me backtrack. We didn't know much about Georgia and North Carolina because the years prior to Rick aren't, weren't as dynamic as, <laughs> uh, I, I think I said that, uh, <laughs> okay, without disrespecting anyone. Um, but he, he changed the trajectory of the program. I think he built the foundation for uh, what Kirby's doing right now. Kirby's taking it to another level. Um, but just a well-rounded coaching staff. Kirby was on that, uh, Bobo was on that, uh, Thomas McClendon, uh, all these individuals who were just critical in success. And so you see the first class get drafted, and you're like, oh, this is actually possible. And, and so it was just an amazing experience. And then I get drafted uh, to Cleveland. Um, Cleveland was slightly different than uh, UGA. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got a Browns fan back there. He can attest to it. Uh, we're still trying to work it out, but you know, I, I think brighter days are ahead. But one of the interesting things that I learned at Cleveland is while I was there, you know, 22, you're still somewhat immature. You're, you're learning and you're complaining about the world around you just because you're like, oh, we're not winning. It's cold. You know, this isn't happening. It's Cleveland, it's not Atlanta, it's not Georgia. Uh, but I love Cleveland, I love Cleveland, I love Cleveland, I love Cleveland. Um, 
but we had a guy, Joe Thomas, who uh, just made the Hall of Fame. And Joe Thomas used to say, like, enjoy this moment because you've worked hard for it, you've self-selected into it, um, and it could be over. And I didn't really understand what that meant until I started getting injured, and I'm like, oh my God. And looking at a guy like Joe Thomas who just put the work in and he made the best of a situation is something now that I reflect on as I'm a lot older and I wish I would have had that mindset when I was younger. And something else that I reflect on is Georgia has had tremendous athletes come before me and they continue to produce them. You know, Champ Bailey, Hines Ward, Ben Watson. Had I understood what it took to be a pro and not just a good athlete, I probably would have reached out earlier for mentorship. Um, and that's something that I think about now is just having really quality mentors that want to help you maximize your talent so you don't leave any performance on the table. Yeah, I think it's so interesting a couple of things you said. You said that you self-selected to get into the NFL, right? And I think that's such an interesting mindset because it's like you put in the work for years and years and years at a totally different level than a lot of people are able to accomplish. So this idea that I've put in the work, I've self-selected, and then now I get to enjoy it, I think is a really cool takeaway from that experience. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting to me when I see people that are, people that have the, the option, yeah. you know, where they're in jobs and in careers that they don't enjoy. And it's like, you should self-select into the thing that you enjoy. Because yeah. sports, you know, I see a couple of athletes around the room, it's hard, you know, you get hurt, you get injured, you're constantly getting critiqued. You know, you have 90,000 people screaming at you to do something well and a ton of people watching at home. Uh, and so you have to be willing to endure that. It can't be forced upon you. And even now in life, the things that I do, I try to self-select in so I can give my all to it um, and be fully intentional about it because it's, it's not easy. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's amazing. I think the other thing you said that really resonates with me is that you need different mentors at different phases in your life, right? And as you move through your career, as you move through performing at a really high level, you might need different things from different people. And so being really purposeful about continuing to choose to do the things that you like, but also find people who can help you at those different stages in your journey, I think is such a great point. Yeah, it's not always ability. Sometimes it's just knowledge and the like best way to do it. And so a lot of times I'm reaching out to people prior to going into something, say, just give me the lay of the land here. Um, and then from there, I can kind of craft it the way that I need to craft it. But if you go into something blind, it's just too much that you need to know. It's too much, there's too many variables that are taking place. And so, especially in the Georgia community, the Georgia community has been tremendous of just, if I reach out to somebody, they're gonna you know, reach back and they're gonna give advice and they're gonna give insight and say, hey, you should do this, you should do that. And it's allowed me to leapfrog a lot of things that probably would have taken way too much time or I, I would have broken in the process. Yeah, amazing. I love that. You mentioned Kirby. So let's, can you just share your opinion on what's driving the tremendous success of the program today? You mentioned the foundation that Coach Rick built, and then we've you know, obviously taken it to a whole nother level. I think I'm probably preempting a Q&A question, but let's just hit it here. Like, what do you think, what do you think is driving that success? I mean, I think it's a lot of things. He's a dog, you know, um, he went to school with a few people here. And so I, I think the pride that he has, of representing the university. Uh, Mary Beth, his wife, is also a dog. Um, he was a great player, and so he can he can talk to the players and understand he knows what they're going through. He, he knows what they're working towards. Um, he's meticulous. He, he's relentless. He truly cares about his players and wants the best for them. If you see how players rally behind him and how he's celebrating and how he's jumping, you can tell that there's a special bond that um, is outside of football. Um, he cares about the older guys. When my accident happened, he was at the hospital. I, I don't know where the guy finds the time to do everything, and he engages with everything, and his attention to detail. And he's another guy that, that breeds excellence. He has high standards, and he's not lowering them for anyone, and he's gonna make everybody raise their level of performance. And I think you continue to see that, and people wanna come play um, for a guy like that. I wish I still had some <laughs> eligibility. <laughs> I love that. You mentioned, you mentioned your accident. I think hopefully if, if people in the room haven't seen the Players Tribune video that you did kind of talking about the accident and the evolution, I'd encourage you guys to check it out. But, but maybe share the, with the group a little bit about your recovery and sort of what you learned through that process. Yeah, so we're in the South. Um, and we have a lot of land. People like their four-wheelers. Uh, please retire if you still ride four-wheelers. Um, while they're fun, they can be very dangerous. And so in April of 2017, you know, joyriding uh, and my life changed. My ATV ended up flipping, shatters my hand. 
And the significance of that for me in playing wide receiver where this hand basically changes the trajectory of my family and that be the thing that I lose um, was just mentally just difficult in a range of emotions where it's depression, it's anxiety, it's fear, like will I lose another body part? Uh, and so I had to go do the work for that, uh, just mentally going to get therapy and counseling. And I think that's a, something that a lot of people shy away from. And I started to actually realize that we didn't actually talk a lot about the hand. We talked about life and there was just certain things that were buried throughout the years that I needed to address. And so it was just an amazing experience and I'd recommend, like even if you don't lose a body part, which I hope <laughs> <laughs> no, no one does, you know, just uh, checking on your mental health just to make sure that you're functioning at a high clip. Uh, but then it became time to, to really say like, what's the alternative? Do I sit here and do I like soak at life and think life is over? Or do I realize that I'm 30 and I, you know, hopefully have like another 70 years of this thing um, to, to have fun at it. And you have people that are pushing you, you know, where it's, you know, I remember one time AJ was like, get up, uh, we're going to work out. And I'm like, man, I don't want to work out. And, you know, he comes and he's like, go work out. Uh, and so you have people that are telling you to get back in the game, get back in the game. And so it's the internal drive, but also the external um, of people making sure that you're okay and, and, and doing well. Uh, and then that just kind of, set the chain reaction of saying, all right, what am I actually interested in? Who am I? Uh, I self-selected into being a football player, but I was kind of like still trying to figure out what I wanted to do in this adult version of me and started to lock in and say, well, I'm really fascinated with people, I'm really fascinated with performance, really fascinated with business. What's the undercurrent here to actually get businesses to move forward? And it's their people and getting them to perform. Yeah, that's amazing. Maybe I would work out if AJ Green came and <laughs> told me. I don't know, maybe I would. Probably not, probably not, honestly. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you talked about, you had this time to reflect. I think first, you know, I, I think it's really important that you mentioned the work that you did, the therapy. I think we're hearing that a lot more in personal life. Like I have friends who are now willing to share that they're going and doing some work. I have people at work, colleagues, who say, oh, I can't come to this meeting because I'm going to therapy. And it's just like, I'm so glad that that's becoming part of a dialogue that we're more comfortable having today because it is so important to sort of check in on yourself, right? And so thank you for, for sharing that and mentioning that. And I, I think you said you learned through this process where you had to sort of take time and reflect that you really cared about people. You studied psychology undergrad you came back for a master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology. I don't think we mentioned the little, you know, leadership program at Harvard, the MBA at Harvard that you did. So, you know, you've been studying and learning about people. Where does that passion come from? Like when you kind of look back at your at your career, you you clearly have this passion for people and organizations. I mean, is that rooted in the efficacy of a team sport or you know, where does that come from? Uh, it's multifaceted, honestly. Um, so being the fact that, you know, I'm a Liberian American, you, I don't live in Liberia, I live in America. And so you feel Liberian, you feel American, and it's like always this, you know, inner working tension between the two. But then you look around and you see everyone has a backstory, everyone is, you know, multidimensional. Uh, and so one of my favorite things to do is just be in big cities and just people watch. Um, I've always been that way. And then you add the layer of being on teams where you have people from all over the place with different stories and you're trying to get these people that are super tight, a, <laughs> very big egos to all be aligned to the same thing and um, trust each other and be vulnerable and work together. And so those themes have stayed consistent throughout life. And then when an accident happened and you have this adverse situation, you start to realize that we're all working in adverse situations, especially in work, you know, if you've made it through the last three years, you know how dynamic um, work has been. And so those interests have been stable over time. And as I combine them, the just next evolution of that is being able to consult and help, you know, organizations troubleshoot their people strategy. Yeah, I love that. My dad had a quote on a post-it note, you know, nothing fancy on his computer. And it said, be kinder than necessary because everyone's fighting some kind of battle. And so that idea that we all have this backstory, we all have something that we're working through can carry into a team. And then to your point, it can carry in to an organization. I think you, you said something, uh, there's a quote that I read where you said, if you're not getting the most out of 
all of your teammates, right? Like a business organization, any organization, is about getting the best from everyone and combining it to achieve a goal, right? And you, you know, you said there's all these type A people in organizations or, you know, people, I'm sure we've all run into people with big egos in business organizations sometimes, but how do you, how do you focus on getting that group <laughs> to work together effectively? How do you focus on gathering all of those adverse situations that people are going through and moving that towards making people feel included and making people feel belonging in an organization? And how important is that for the sort of efficacy of a team? I mean, it's very important. I, I don't think a lot of people actually, they know what their business does, but they don't actually know the business that they're in. And a better way to say that is they don't know their missions, they don't know their values, they don't actually know the competencies needed to do the job at the high level. And so you just have random people doing things and it's not really connected. To me as an athlete, that's very confusing. Because if you look at, let's say, football, you know how defense matches with offense, how special teams is activated. If I were to say, Georgia's down by six points in the fourth quarter, two minutes to go, everyone would say, hey, the defense has to get the ball back, the offense has to score, special teams has to you know, hopefully kick the extra point. In an organization, people don't actually know where they fit. People are trying to do other people's jobs. People are stepping out of their boundaries. People are doing it disrespectfully. And so if you can't diagnose those things and you're just trying to put band-aids on certain things, it becomes a domino effect that just bleeds into every sector of the organization. And that doesn't mean work still doesn't get done at a high level. It's just the experience of getting work done is not optimal. And so you're leaving performance on the table. Um, one of the things you learn in sports is not just about showing up. We play in a highly competitive, fast-moving world. So if you're not at your best, chances are you're not even gonna be a sustained success or you're gonna get beat. And so if you look at an organization and there's all these things that are getting in the way of true performance and you're in a competitive landscape, you're not gonna be able to compete long-term. Or you have turnover, you have low engagement, you have other things that just make it miserable for the employees. Yeah, I love that you focus on that. Yeah, maybe you're getting good work done, but maybe it's probably not sustainable because if you're not working well as a team, then it's not very much fun, right? And so that leads to turnover and, and ultimately unsustainability. There's been so much focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last couple of years. And then I read an article this week where which I think they're talking about changing it to sort of diversity and belonging. We just talk about that uh, in your opinion on sort of how you can incorporate those best practices into business. Yeah, it's actually, it's slightly confusing because if you look at a lot of companies, especially the bigger ones, they have access to the best talent in the world. And that talent thinks differently, they approach problems differently, and if you get them to work together efficiently, they can innovate and troubleshoot and allow you really not to be commoditized. But if you just have this homogenous team where everyone has similar skill sets and there's group think, they're gonna approach the problems the same. And so where a lot of DEI work looks at is more so, do we have the right metrics? Do we have the right composition of people? Versus saying, how do I get the best people that allow me to perform? And a lot of times that will be in a different skill set because you don't want the same version of the person. So I think if we reframe it, it won't be as divisive. It won't be as thorny to certain people. And you give people a chance to come in and do their best work and allow them to do things in a way that push the organization forward. And that's across generational lines, that's across racial lines, it's across um, um, countries, whatever the case may be. And there's this thing, we were at Harvard, and it's like, how do you find leapfrogging technologies? Where there may be a person in the world, a country in the world, where they don't have the things that we have here, and they've, so they've had to innovate differently. But it actually translates very well to what we're doing here. And so if you're not looking for the right things, you separate that person out of your talent pool when in reality they're the person that can move things forward. And that could be anywhere. It could be in a working mom, it could be an LGBT person, it could be tall, short, whatever the case may be. And so I'm more of a fan of how do we find the right people with the right skill sets versus how do we just look at demographics for the sake of demographics. And this idea that we can't find it is more so I don't know what I'm looking for and I'm just gonna go to the thing that's most comfortable to me bias in kind of we're trying to remove that bias and cast a wider net yeah and I think that makes I think that makes total sense what, what in your experience you've worked with a lot of organizations what in your experience do organizations who do this well right who have high performing teams who don't have 
all quarterbacks, right? They have everybody optimized, you know, knowing exactly what they're doing. What, in your experience, do organizations like that have in common? Like, how do they manage their people effectively? Well, one, they're measuring. Uh, and they're not just sending out pulse surveys to say, like, how do you feel about today? <laughs> you know, did you like the food? Do you like the company logo? They're actually measuring, like, how people are experiencing work. What are the barriers that are getting in the way of work? How's your manager doing? Is there any work-life balance issues? Like, the true things that actually give you a pulse. And they're doing that across the whole organization, not just with the executive team or just with, you know, the week-long training that you do. They truly have a pulse. And they're activating that across the entire employee cycle, whether it be benefits, whether it be, you know, um, how work is structured. All these things are factored into the employee experience. And if you do that well, you get your employees actually highly engaged to report problems and their safety and their trust. And so companies that are doing that, I think, will continue to retain their talent. Um, and companies that aren't will struggle because now people have access to information of what's taking place at other companies. And so when people are leaving, they're leaving a lot of time to greener pastures because they've done their research. Yeah, it's amazing. There's so many, it's just different now. People do have so many more options. I think we've all seen in big organizations, more than ever after the pandemic, you understand that people have a choice, right? And especially younger people have a choice. I mean, they're talking to their friends about their experiences. They're talking to each other about their bad bosses, their good bosses, right? You mentioned that sort of direct manager relationship, which I think we've all seen is so critical in organizations to make sure that that's an effective relationship. And people are gonna you know, self-select into things that they enjoy more than ever now. Will you talk about Vessel a little bit, the organization that you started uh, to help companies accomplish these goals and, and work on solving these problems? Yeah, so what an organizational psychologist is, like we're cared about the employee experience and how they allow the organization to perform. And so in order to do that, you know, we gotta diagnose what's taking place. Think about going to a doctor, getting a physical, they're gonna kinda give you an idea of what your body's doing. So before we start anything, we want a clean idea of what's going on or you could start to solve something um, and actually cause more problems down the line. So we're diagnosing what's taking place and then we're helping leaders come up with strategy for their talent. Um, and then after you do that, you're trying to collaborate and figure out how do we create something that works for you. I don't believe any consultant is an expert on how your industry or how your team works because you should be the person we may be able to help guide you. And so we're kind of walking alongside um, different organizations to figure out how do we get this done at a high level and then hopefully we can turn it over to them and they become sustainable and we only have to troubleshoot. Yeah, I love that. I also love that your focus on metrics because measuring something repeatedly, sustainably, requires a purposeful approach, right? It's a lot of work to gather all of that information in any size organization. But if you're measuring it, you're showing that you're acting with purpose. And so I think that that approach within kind of organizational dynamics is so critical and something that requires a lot of thought and purpose, so. Yeah, a lot of times you only see financial metrics and- Which are good, by Which way. are great, you know, as uh, they're, they're wonderful. And they could be misleading though, because you don't know how the work is getting done. And so you could have a great quarter, a great year, and maybe there's just something that is not repeatable. But if you're tracking, and this is the thing, probably the athlete in me, we measure everything. Like if you were to go back to September of 2005, you could tell what I was doing at that time. Like there's very clean metrics in the things that we care about. And over time, you can tell that those behaviors are either gonna lead to success or they're not. And so in an organization, there are not many metrics like that that show this type of behavior within this department, within this manager, or these type of employees, they're gonna lead to success. And so we try to get companies to understand what are those behaviors that over time will lead you to success. And without those, you're kind of just putting patches on you know, problems and you're hoping that they work. Yeah, absolutely, I love that. And we've all, you know, I think we've probably, a lot of us have seen it done not well as many times as, as we've seen it done well. So I think the idea that you have an organization that has that deep skill set that is focused on helping people walk through that progression for the long term, I think is, is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, when you think of employees are probably gonna be one, two, or three, you know, highest line item, you know, behind maybe your real estate or if you're in some type of medical industry and you 
have high research costs, but it's up there, and so you might as well understand how they can create value for you. Um, and if you have a lot of employees that are self-selecting in to be a part of that, they're going to try to create more value because that's what they actually want to do. That's what they care about. And so we're really focused on like how do you maximize the potential? Good performance, I mean, it's kind of useless um, in all honesty. You're trying to maximize performance sustainably. I love that. Okay, well, I'll maybe stop trying to get as much free advice as I can for my organization. Um, let's maybe open it up to Q&A for the room. I'm sure we have a bunch. I keep going. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for coming. I'm Audrey Merkel, 06 grad, go dogs, actually from Grady, so thanks for um, letting me join you guys. So my question is, we touched a little bit around the importance of leadership, but I'm curious to understand times where you've gone into an organization, I'm sure it's those leaders that have actually brought you into the organization and you realize that they need to be more part of the solution. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of the competencies of leadership and how critical that is into the performance of the team um, and sort of that dynamic within a company? That's a great question. I've actually learned to give grace because a lot of leaders are really good at what they do, marketing, finance, you know, law. They've never actually learned to lead. And so as they continue to move up, they're being asked to do things that they never learned and they're doing the best that they can. And so as you help kind of safely walk a person through and help them understand that their job gets easier, the better that they lead and their people are going to be more productive and enjoy this experience more. A lot of leaders, not all, will start to let their guard down and understand what they need to do. And their team will actually help them, and they'll, you'll, you'll build this bridge. It's almost like, use Kirby, for example. You know, I'll use a sports analogy. He has a certain view from the sidelines. The players have a certain view from the field. If they're not in communication of whatever the best way to do this, it's gonna be very hard to like make adjustments in real times. And just how the dynamics are within you know, true organizations, that line of communication isn't always clean as to what can I do. And it's different from organization to organization. That's why it's really tricky if somebody just looks and says, these are the top five things that a leader should do. It kind of depends on your personnel. You know, some people want more feedback. Some people want more autonomy. Some people need you to reward them certain ways. It, it depends on what your people need. And that's why it's so important to measure on the front end, because if you're just going with this cookie cutter approach, you may miss the mark. I think a civil line is that it revealed a lot of cracks in the system. And so things that people <clears throat> never paid attention to, at least now they know. Whether they solve it or not is on them. But at least now you, everybody had a chance to slow down at the same time and evaluate and hear what was going on around them, which a lot of times we don't give ourselves the space to do. And so I think that's a silver lining. I think the challenge for some people is that they just put their head back in the sand and think that they could do it the ways that they could do it prior to the pandemic, which is dangerous because the world is moving maybe faster now than it was pre-pandemic. And so I would encourage leaders to continue to slow down to understand what's going on around them and make the changes that they can make. You can't make everything, you know, but if you can make improvements on a couple things, you know, a year, I think over time you'll make the type of progress that you need. You mentioned being purposeful as well. We talked about metrics require you to be purposeful because it takes a lot of organization. I think that's, a, to your point, through the pandemic, we had to be so much more purposeful about engaging with people and communicating to people because it wasn't without thought in the office, right? You had to really focus on that. And so I think that point of people now expect some amount of sort of purposeful communication through from leadership 
And for us to sort of turn back and not maintain that is really dangerous because people know now what a purposeful approach looks like, what good communication looks like. And so you can't just go back to the way it was before. I think we see that a lot in organizations. Yeah, people don't want to just work for an organization. They want to feel like they're a part of the organization. They want you to communicate with them. They want to be included in the decision makers. They want to know why we're doing certain things. It's no longer just do as I say. And so I think that's a good thing, though, because it's shared. It's shared responsibility. It's shared accountability in how we move things forward. And you may see that there's things that are just lying dormant within your organization that are solutions that you're looking for, but it's just there. A person's not engaged to solve it, or they don't know that this is a priority. And so constantly kind of taking steps back and evaluating where your business is, where your people are, I think helps you just continue to move forward at a faster clip. Slow down. Go. My guy. <laughs> What's up, man? Um, Don't tackle me. <laughs> I ain't gonna tackle you, bro. I promise. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Nah, but um, number one, bro, I just want to tell you how proud of you I am, man. Just um, you know, you know how far we've can come, and um, you know, I just think about the journey, man. And you talked a lot about just your progression, the transition, all those different things. But I want you to speak to the entrepreneurs in the room, man. Like, what was that journey like of not only creating Vessel, but you know, getting to the Microsofts and you know, just the the little things that, you know, when you're at home and it's, it's dark at night, you're working on the branding and the, the sales pitch. Like, what was that process like? I'll give you different phases. Um, so starting out, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's, I, I got asked to speak. Um, it's actually a big consultant firm that brought me in and they were working with a client doing IT transformation and they were just focused on the process of the IT transformation. They really weren't focused on the people. And that's where I was kind of leading. And the managing director was like, hey, you know, we're not doing this. Can you work with us? And so that was just like falling into it. Um, and so the first thing is be aware of the opportunities that you're not expecting. Because you may be going down another path and something gets revealed to you. And so in working with that individual, you know, they were happy and we kept doing stuff. And then you're like, okay, now what? is this? And so you're out and you're pitching what you think this thing is. And I had a guy ask me, um, it was a profit equity guy, it was going well, and he was like, you're an athlete though, like what do you know about this? And I was like, ah, you know, I'm kind of giving my best pitch. And then he was like, are you even qualified to do this work? I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been asked that before. Um, and that's what actually like forced me to go back to school because it was like, I don't, I want to answer this question for myself before someone else asks me. And so I would tell the entrepreneurs in the room to qualify yourself so that when you go into opportunities, you're not just pulling off the hip, like you actually feel confident in what you can do. Um, and then if you go at it alone, once again, it's just too much, too, 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 too much. And so I've relied on the network, the Georgia network, where I'm reaching out to people. There's people in the room here where I'll call and I'm saying, hey, I'm going into this type of situation. Give me advice on it. Or, hey, I want to get into this situation. Give me advice on it. And sometimes it's, eh, you're not ready for that. And you want to hear why you're not ready for that so you can go build up that skill set. Um, and then it's sometimes, hey, this is how I would approach it. Or the timing's off. But if you try to do anything alone, like you need a team of people. Um, and that team of people will open up doors for you. That team of people will give you the answers to the test. And, and that's actually what you want. Um, and then it's your responsibility to continue to improve and maneuver as you see fit. Don't tackle me. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Charles Brooks, full-time MBA student, uh, class of 2024. Uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on helping organizations and leaders deal with this idea of remote work and social connection, that balance? Um, that's a really good question. So it's not going to change. Re remote work is here to stay. And how do I say it? There's a lot of companies that are forcing their people to come back. And the leaders think that that's what they want. And for some people, that works. But some people see that they would rather have something else. And so I think you have to be comfortable with that trade off that you may lose certain people. I do think there's value in people getting together. It builds bonds that at this point in time, I don't think can be done fully virtually or remote. 
but you have to understand what work can be done home and what work do you need people there for. Um, there's a commercial real estate um, shop in town where they were trying to figure out a lot of their talent solution. And you go and everybody's on Zoom in the office and <laughs> they had one of their managing directors from another part of the country actually call in from home. And I'm like, just think about the optics. You're in commercial real estate and this person's taking this call from home. And you start to realize that while you do want people in an office space, especially if you're paying for it, what is the most value of your employees' time and efforts? And once they start to understand that, to convince people to come back makes more sense and to allow people to stay home makes more sense. And then it's this whole idea of how do you monitor what they're doing. Um, there needs to be tools for that to actually understand what is work and not just let me check how many times this person has jiggled the keyboard um, because per <laughs> People would just go to Amazon and buy a keyboard jiggler, and then, <laughs> you know, you're like, "Oh, this person's a high performer. They're 12 hours today." <laughs> uh -huh. So once again, is is the understanding of what do you need your employees to do, holding them to that level, um, and then collaborating with them to figure out what makes sense. I like legacy businesses. And the reason for that is because they're probably ripe for disruption. And so they're trying to figure out their talent strategy. Um, businesses that have HR functions, but they don't really have sophisticated people analytics functions. Um, they're just not measuring it. HR kind of functions as payments, benefits, time off, compliance, that type thing. Like they're not really integrated into the strategy of the business. Um, some of the bigger companies were really through network. Um, the scope of those probably is not sustainable for where we are, but those small to medium sized businesses is where we thrive. Um, teams that are highly competent um, and just don't focus on that people side is where we like to play. Uh, industries, it more so depends on how interconnected the business is. Like if you have to work not in silos. And so what I mean by that is, I know lawyers sometimes just, they can kind of do their own thing. It wouldn't really be a fit because we're not really putting pieces together there. But where finance has to work with marketing, marketing has to work with legal, those type scenarios, you know, we love to play in. That's a great question. Uh, if you look at the rate of turnover in the, I guess, the chief diversity officer space, it's ridiculously high. You know, two, two and a half years, these people are turning over. And that position doesn't actually have a lot of weight, and it doesn't have a lot of responsibility. It's not, let me use this person to find me the best talent, develop the best talent, understand where this talent is struggling so that they can't move up. It's just, how do I bring in the best talent and troubleshoot challenges? that are societal. Um, and that the societal challenges are very tricky because they don't always start within the organization. I think organizations have the ability to influence society, but they can't always change societal challenges. And so if you are a team with a cluster of diverse talent, if it's just one person, you know, to carry that weight is very difficult and they'll probably leave where they can find a, you know, more robust community so they don't have to be the voice of, you know, I can't speak for all black people or all Liberians, you know, not qualified to do so. And sometimes that's what that person's responsibility is. 
And so if you could bring in clusters, develop them, teach them what they need to get to the upward um, level of management, you'll start to be, I think, surprised because there's been tons of people that fit that demographic that have done well. And that can be anything. It could be when men, women, LGBT, you know, foreign, English as a second language, neurodiverse, whatever it is, these people shine bright. But you have to define what you need them to do to get to that second level just so they're not working really hard and it's not what you're looking for. And if you could do that, then you can make an objective decision versus just saying, oh, I've known this person for 10 years and I think they'll do a good job. Um, so, yeah. You have different mentors, I'll say that. And so there's different people that I can go to for different things. And as a younger person, you have certain people that gravitate towards you and they're showing you help. And it, they may not like title themselves as a mentor, but if you have an older person that you trust and you respect that is trying to give you advice, listen. And filter it through obviously where you want to go, but don't dismiss it because it may not even be applicable to that situation, but it may resonate down the line once you start to connect the dots. And so in different sectors, I have mentors for family, I have mentors for business, I have mentors for faith, I have mentors that tell me to stay in shape. There's a ton of different things um, that these mentors allow. And so I would have multiple mentors to just periodically check in with them and build relationships. And then I wouldn't use my mentors. I would hopefully try to reciprocate whatever you can add value to them, just so you know they're busy people, they have families, they have work, they have other responsibilities. You don't just wanna make sure that like you're draining from them. Hopefully you can put something of value on their radar and like truly develop a real relationship with them. <laughs> Generational differences. Uh, um, I would say, so I'm 36 and people say I'm young. Uh, and so I wouldn't rush trying to solve for everything now. I would figure out where can I add value in a real, not where I think I can add value, but where can I add actual value, and I would focus on that. Um, it could be sending in an article. It could be hearing something in conversation that you then take the initiative to go do. It could be giving insight on something. Maybe there's something that fits your demographic that your company's working on. You could be the person that does the research for it in a way that puts it on a business leader's radar. I think that right now it's about learning how to add value and learning yourself and where you want to add value. Because if you're like, hey, you know, I just want to go change the world, that's, everybody's trying to do that. It's very hard. Um, but where can you add value so that you set yourself up when you look up and you actually have life figured out? And that, that would be a process to have life figured out. Um, and so it would be adding value now, adding value now and understanding how you can add value now and how you can continue to add value now and being selfless about it. Um, and then over time, you'll see that all that good equity that you put in the world helps you when you actually like, you're ready to move forward. <clears throat> Yeah. 
So I, it, ironically, I don't speak a lot. I'll do speeches like this where someone's like, oh, you speak. And then it's, it's, I look at speeches, I think I told you, it's, it's like giving the kid the iPad on the car ride. Like you get the kid to be quiet for a little bit and then as soon as you take it away, they start screaming again. And so it's not actually sustainable for behavioral change. And so our work kind of functions in three buckets. Uh, the first is diagnostics. Some companies just want to understand like, what are we dealing with? And that could take anywhere from a month to three months, just to kind of, depending on the size of the organization. Now, if they want to follow that up and actually start to change, then we get to the six to 15 month process where we're actually walking alongside and functioning as true consultants. And then there's some times where companies just, they want to dip their toe in the water. And so we'll do an offsite, we'll do a retreat, you know, we'll do some type of learning and development just to give exposure um, to what this thing is that they care about. It's an exec, it's, it's CEO, CFO, COO. It's, it's depending on the size of the company where you know, certain execs kind of function as a CEO of their division. It could be a chief legal officer. And so it's usually the C-suite person, if not the reality of getting that thing done either from a initiative standpoint, a budget standpoint, just doesn't really turn full circle, so. It's probably in that 250 to 2,000 range, um, but if yeah, employees. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make them quick. <laughs> So that's a good question. So a personality test, um, different people feel differently about that. Um, you may use that in your hiring process. You may use that to kind of understand how people are wired, but that doesn't always tell you like how the team functions completely. And so I'm thinking more of what are the barriers to get this work done? Is there any resource constrictions? Are there silos that need to be broken up? Um, is there manager feedback that things aren't getting done right? Like the, the true things that allow you to perform is more what I care about. And it's not on the, always the individual level, it's the team as a whole. And then if, if you zoom out, it's how this department works with this other department. It's more understanding the network within the organization that we think about. I saw a hand go up, I'll do it real quickly. So, um, I obviously think we'll repeat. I, I, I think uh, I am very high on Carson Beck. I, I think when a person sits, they wait their turn, they put the work in, they don't leave. Uh, I think he's gained the respect of a lot of people. He's played well uh, when he's gotten a chance to play. Uh, having Bobo back is special, uh, paired with Kirby's defense, I think there's a lot of just pride in that whole system. The thing that makes it really interesting is that a lot of coaches are trying to figure out this whole NIL thing. They're trying to figure out how to not get their kids to transfer. But people are very passionate about being dogs. They're very passionate about staying here. They're very passionate about playing. And I think Kirby's shown that he's going to play the best person um, that allows Georgia to succeed. Uh, you see that with Stetson Bennett. Where Ideally, you know, you don't have a walk on at a program like us um, being a shot caller. And then I think Kirby's been able to find the talent that makes sense for our organization. I don't think you'd find a high profile player out of, you know, Napa Valley, but we got that in Brock Bowers. And so um, when you know how to find talent, the talent believes in what you're doing and they're willing to put it all on the line. Uh, and you have a crazy rabbit fan base like we have, myself included. <laughs> Um, it bodes well for good things happening. <laughs> 
so thank, thanks everyone for the time this morning. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm, uh, I took a lot away from this. I think the idea of self-selecting into things that you enjoy, the idea of using data, being purposeful about organizations and developing your people, and then mostly just gratitude, right? Living with gratitude, being so thoughtful, and and really, I'm really grateful for you and, and for you to take the time this morning and for filling all of us up. Just thank you very much for being here. I thank y'all. Um, Georgia's meant a lot to me. Uh, I live here, I'm not from here. Um, and it's because of just the love of this community. Uh, Ron Corson, who's our head athletic trainer, he was my primary care physician up to like three or four years ago. Uh, and so I, I love this place. Uh, thank y'all for all y'all do for me. Thank y'all for all y'all do for you know, athletes, um, and let's just continue to build together. And so I think, where is Meredith? I think she says, what is it? No dog walk along or no, what is the saying? Yeah, I mean, never bark alone. Never bark alone. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think that holds true. Anywhere that I've been in the world, I can have my Georgia gear on and somebody will walk by and say, go dogs. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank y'all. Um, and please consider me a friend on your journey. Muhammad, thank you for being with us today. I've got the appropriately colored red and black oh. sculpture to give you as a thank you. Uh, your work is fascinating. I think we'll have a sign up uh, for anybody who wants to, to use Vessel um, and the services that you provide. So thank you all for being here today. Thank Muhammad as well. And I've been told that parking is taken care of, so the arm should be up. So there's no reason to validate that. I hope everyone has a great rest of this month and look forward to seeing you back in June. Thank you.